Well, good evening, everybody. We're going to wait just about another minute before we get started, and I want to thank you. We've got about 100 people on the call this evening, and we're really thrilled and honored to have you join us. We'll, uh, uh, as I just said, we'll, we'll start in just a bit. A um, little bit of a background. We're doing a webinar tonight, so you're not seeing the faces of all the people. We don't have to worry about mics on and mics off, et cetera. Um, we've got a, a really impressive presentation and a couple of introductions we want to do on the front end. So as Karen and I welcome you tonight on behalf of both of the boards of uh, Floridians for Democracy Institute and Floridians for Democracy, we do want to thank you for attending. Uh, many of you know that uh, we received the $25,000 matching grant. Uh, we're about $8,000 short, but we want to thank the folks that have participated in helping make this happen. Our focus isn't to make money. Our focus is to protect and preserve democracy and to collaborate with organizations. And you're going to meet some organizations this evening that we're in the process of, of working and collaborating with. We've extended the time to, six, to um, 8.45 um, as opposed to uh, from 7 to 8.30 just to make sure there's some Q&A time because uh, our special present presentation um, is uh, quite extensive but really important messages uh, for us to hear. Uh, the, re the program will be recorded and uh, the uh, and you can receive copies at, at your request. Um, and we will also send the slides uh, to participants um, if you'd like uh, that are participating this evening. Uh, pretty impressive uh, deck of, of slides that Bryn has developed for us. Um, <clears throat> we want to give a special thanks to uh, uh, Rich Scissors uh, from uh, representing the uh, Florida Veterans for Common Sense. He's the uh, person that helped put this uh, program together for us this evening uh, structurally so that we can record this and um, and do it through the webinar structure that uh, the uh, Floridians group has. Uh, we also um, um, want to, to introduce a couple of really special people to you. And uh, so let's get started. If everybody's ready. It's uh, my honor to first introduce to you uh, for a couple of minutes, David Brostrom. Uh, David is from Venice, and he was one of the uh, founders of the Social Justice Alliance of Florida Suncoast in Venice and a key organizer for the February 20th, 24th Right to Read Festival. So we've asked David just to tell us a little bit about the importance of of collaboration and teamwork and what you did in Venice. Thank you, Jim and Karen and Rich and everybody. Um, it's an honor to be here and be part of this. Our freedoms to read, learn, and express our authentic selves are dramatically at risk in Florida. And that goes for the rest of the country too. With these restrictive trends and laws, how do we defeat the book banners and the fascism threatening this state? One of the answers is we focus on how we can actively help democracy flourish and how we carry out this essential mission with others. In our case, after witnessing a school board takeover by conservatives, runaway book banning and the suppression of LGBTQ rights, it was essential that we create or join an action-based collaborative. So we did get together and it was, and ultimately formed the Social Justice Alliance of the Florida Sun Coast. We germinated a single idea in 2023, and now it's grown into an alliance of more than 15 like-minded groups. Our first big project, the Right to Read Festival, All Books for All People, was a pushback against Florida's prejudiced book challenge and censorship laws. These recent laws threatened to criminalize teachers and librarians and decimate diversity in school library collections. Our Alliance members fortunately also connected with other statewide groups, including Floridians for Democracy, Florida Veterans for Common Sense, and Choose Democracy. These new partners helped us flourish, and we are committed to helping them out. These alliances create more leverage to get big things done. And I feel strongly that the reason we attracted 800 people to the Right to Read Festival last month was that collaborations work wonders. Thank you. Wow, beautiful, David. Thank you so much. 
And now it's my honor to introduce to you all Carol Brady uh, from the Atlantic Beach area, but she's got a special story to share with us of collaboration in the whole Jacksonville um, region that will have implications for the state and for November. Carol? Well, we hope we can live up to that billing, Jim. Um, I well, um, am with an organization called the Beaches Activist Movement, which is a progressive group um, in the Jacksonville Beach area. And we have um, allied with uh, Indivisible National and received a, a small grant along with um, a sister organization here in Jacksonville called Indivisible Mandarin. And um, part of this grant was actually to strengthen collaboration among groups in the Jacksonville area that are working specifically on Get Out the Vote. And so we're in the process now of planning, we're calling it the um, Joy Joyful Resistance Together We Win Summit on May 8th. And uh, the fortunate thing about this uh, planning is that we were able to connect with Floridians for Democracy, specifically Jim and Bill, who have been invaluable to us in the planning process in terms of being able to bounce off ideas and brainstorm speakers and quite honestly, generously leveraged connections and networks that they had to help us put together, I think, a really smashing program. So um, we will um, uh, keep you informed about how it goes, but it's um, a very exciting opportunity and I think is gonna have a big impact on our success in 2024. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Carol, and congratulations for what you're doing. It's so important. Um, I said this, and a few of you may have signed on late, so I'll just reinforce. We are doing this uh, through webinar tonight, so you don't see the faces of all the other people, but you'll be able to uh, put questions of our special speaker in the Q&A um, uh, part of, of your screen. Not Do not use the chat. You're welcome to use the chat to chat with each other, to throw out ideas, et cetera, but the Q&A Bill Petrarca, one of our co-founders, is going to uh, manage that process. Thank you, Bill. And uh, and when we finish with um, uh, with Bryn's presentation, then Bill will come on the screen with Bryn. But you'll only see when she speaks, you'll see her along with her slides. Um, with that, it's uh, my honor to introduce to you another collaborator, uh, Dr. Dale Anderson, uh, founder of Choose Democracy Now in Sarasota. And he's been a key partner with Floridians for Democracy in our Florida D Democracy at Risk series, of which tonight is one of those where we see some key elements of what we're at risk. Um, also, you'll be able to hear a little bit later from Jeff Call, who is a veteran Navy pilot, um, flew in the same kinds of, of planes that uh, Bryn has been in. And uh, he's a co-founder uh, in one of the, actually the first person that I spoke with after Karen said to me, we need to do the 1939 project, which has now grown into 850 people in Floridians for Democracy. So with that, Dale, it's my honor to introduce you and ask you to uh, introduce Brent. Fair enough, thanks, Jim. So uh, again, I'm Dale Anderson. I'm with Choose Democracy Now!, which is one of the coalition members of the Floridians for Democracy. And I have the pleasure this evening of introducing our speaker, Bryn Tannehill. I first became aware of Bryn's writings when I read an article by her entitled, Trans People Are, Are in Grave Danger. It was so well written and compelling, I did a search on Google and found she had written two books, one American Fascism in 2021, and another Everything You Want to Know About uh, Trans in 2019. I read both books on, and her book on fascism uh, is one of the most compelling single volumes about what's happening in the United States. Bryn's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy and the Air Force Institute of Technology with degrees in computer science and operations research. She's a naval avi aviator who did four deployments to locations such as the Adriatic, the Middle East, and the North Atlantic. After leaving active duty, she's continued to work in defense research while as an advocate, writer, and researcher on LGBT civil rights issues and policy. She currently works at a think tank in Washington, DC as a senior analyst where she lives with her wife and three children. 
So welcome, Bryn, and we look forward to your, your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm here today to talk to you about what I'm seeing, about uh, some, of the, some of what's going on in relationship to my book, uh, American Fascism, uh, and help you to understand why I believe that transgender people are in absolutely grave danger and are quite possibly done as a community if Donald Trump wins in 2024. So. Quick bit about myself. Uh, we already talked about it. I'm Naval Academy class of 97, flew a bunch of different aircraft, got some pictures there on the left, uh, currently flying UH-60 Limas for the National Guard, uh, fly for California. Uh, and I've also written for a bunch of different outlets, including New York Times, The Atlantic, New Republic. Uh, I was a DOD, LGBT DOD policy analyst for the 2020 Biden campaign. Uh, and I actually have a third book out there that was published in 2023 uh, called My Child Told Me They're Trans, What Do I Do? A Parents Q&A Guide. Uh, and it's written by me and my wife about uh, questions parents have about raising a transgender child. So what we have here is kind of a risk level for youth. And this is by Aaron Reed, who's a uh, transgender journalist who does systematic reviews of all the legislation going on in the United States. And you can see that the risk as she assessed it in 2022 uh, was not so bad. It was, it was, this is right at the point where we're starting to see an influx of pre-filed bills against transgender people happening. And most of them are targeting trans youth, right? And so that's why the focus of her uh, legislative analysis was on trans youth. By t February 2024, you can see that essentially the middle of the United States and everywhere in the South is deep red. Florida is now red with black bars, indicating that it's a recommendation that transgender people not go to Florida, which is why I'm not with you today. Uh, between the bathroom bans that criminalize me being in a bathroom and the fact that my license is debatably... Uh, uh, legal, uh, it's, it's debatable whether or not Florida would accept my Virginia driver's license as a valid ID at this point, um, based off of the laws that they passed that say that the only uh, IDs that are recognizable uh, are ones that identify you by your birth on gender uh, as it was assigned. This, I so if I get arrested, then I also don't, they won't use, let me use my ID that I have from Virginia as valid ID. And it might not be valid ID for renting a car. So I judged it imprudent given my security clearance, given that I have kids to keep in Fruit Loops and sneakers to come to Florida. So my apologies, but the juice at this point is not worth the squeeze of putting myself at legal risk of being there. For trans adults, uh, notice that this is only September 2023 and February 2024. Between, after 2023, we've seen more and more bills starting to target trans adults after they've effectively gotten almost everything they've wanted against trans youth. There's almost nowhere that trans youth can use a bathroom uh, or get medication or basically even go to school throughout much of the South and the middle of the United States. Effectively, they've been banned from public life uh, for all practical intents and purposes. Now we see Republicans in these states moving on uh, to targeting trans adults. So we're seeing a lot more bills that are less focused on sports and medicine for, for trans youth and bathrooms for trans youth. It's all focused on adults or much more focused on adults. So I wanted to show this to you. This is a heat map of the 532 anti-trans bills filed uh, in 2023. Uh, you can see that uh, most of them, 149 of them, or the plurality of them, were focused on bans on health care for trans youth, banning trans youth from sports, uh, banning anything related to gender, sexual orientation uh, being uh, discussed in schools, uh, and then to a much lesser degree, you see things like uh, bathroom bans, drag bans, 
um, and defining it such that trans people don't exist under the law. And we're going to get back to that one on why that is so incredibly dangerous. Also, birth certificate change bans uh, requiring that trans people mean, uh, be misgendered uh, in, if they uh, are teachers or students. Um, forcing schools to out kids. And if you don't understand why that's dangerous, um, imagine being a kid with really religious parents in the school calling them up and saying, hey, your kid is uh, wants to be called by a different name at school. Well, that's maybe it's going to be a beating. Maybe it's going to be kicking them out of the house. Maybe it's sending them, if they're more wealthy, they're going to send them off to some conversion therapy camp in the Utah desert where they stay for the next three years being beaten and starved um, in order, you know, and they call it the troubled teen industry. So it's, it's pretty ugly, right? So what we have here is the map for this year so far. And you notice that that number's ticked up to 631 active bills. Um, some of them are holdovers from the previous year. Uh, some of them have been defeated uh, as uh, a couple of legislatures have adjourned sin die. But you can see that there's more bills. You can see that there's less gender affirming care bans and a lot more um, obscenity laws. They're trying to essentially say that if that anything related to being LGBT and particularly trans is obscenity online and that uh, Internet service providers uh, can be held uh, legally accountable. And we'll get into this, but the, the big picture goal, right, is that they want to define being transgender as inherently pornographic in, and obscene such that they can ban it in public, in movies, on TV, in libraries, in schools, just the existence of people, right? Trans people is inherently obscene. You can also say that, well, trans people can't come within 2,500 feet of kids or schools or basically could treat them like sex offenders. And literally, that was one of the bills that was up for a vote this year in West Virginia was basically saying trans people have to go on a special list. It's like a sex offender list. Right. And if you know anything about the lead up to the Holocaust, making lists of people is so that you can track them and keep them away from the rest of the public or arrest them if they do go out in public or one of the, the uh, spaces that isn't approved for non-Aryans. That's a bad thing, right? So this is, this is starting to raise the hairs on the back of my neck. We're also seeing more forced outing bills. We're seeing even more bathroom bans. Um, we're also seeing more bills that would define anyone that supports a transgender child, a parent, is guilty of abuse and their child will be taken away by the state. Right. Uh, we're all, and we're also seeing um, ending 32, ending legal recognition bans, which I'll get, get into that in just a moment. But that's a big one, because if transgender people are not cognizable as a class, it can be argued that they no longer even have rational basis scrutiny under the law. And that's the minimum standard for e equal protection clause. This is. There's a parallel history, and we'll get to that. But all of this sums up to they've gotten most of what they want on trans youth. Now they're going after trans adults. And they're also looking at banning, um, uh, looking at banning uh, health care for trans adults, too. It's becoming much more and more blatant. Literally, just today or yesterday, Jordan Peterson called for banning uh all health care for trans people, regardless of age, uh, and that they are all sick freaks who need to go back in the closet by any means necessary, meaning the government make life so miserable for trans people that they flee or go back in the closet or disappear. Uh, keep in mind, Jordan Peterson's really popular and gets goes on the Joe Rogan show all the time, the most popular podcast in the United States. This is just a quick rundown of... Um, medical care bans. Um, most of them affect trans youth. Some of them are starting to creep into trans adults. Uh, Ohio came very, very close this year to passing a policy that would have made it effectively impossible to um, 
get health care as a trans adult because you'd have to go to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a medical ethicist, and a regular doctor before you could get a basic prescription. And if you're somebody who's, you know, like me, transitioned well over a decade ago, you'd still have to go through all of that. The thing is, is that there's really no such thing as a medical bioethicist who practices in trans medicine. This was just something they pulled out of a hat and decided it was if you create enough hoops, you'll eliminate access to care. And this is basically a trap law, right? If you're from target restriction of abortion providers, you know, if you're required that every place that provides abortions need to, needs to be a level one trauma hospital with admitting pris, privileges to every hospital in the state, well, you're probably not going to be able to keep a clinic open just based off of the law. Now, it doesn't theoretically ban it, but it makes it poss- impossible in practice. So uh, these are sports bands. Um, we, we've seen them in almost every state. This has been a big one. This is one of the first ones they jumped on. Uh, in a lot of these states, um, you know, they argue this is about fairness in women's sports. In Utah, when they look, first looked at the law, they found precisely one transgender athlete in the entire state who was 13 and not particularly good. This isn't about women fairness in women's sports. They've banned trans people from freaking billiards, uh, darts, chess, <laughs> uh, disc, disc golf, uh, basically anything. You know, um, Jeopardy. They're trying to they're trying to take prevent Amy uh, from uh, competing in in being counted as a woman in Jeopardy history. Not about fairness. There are barely any trans athletes, and even Leah Thomas, um, who's the, the, the held up as the poster child, won a national championship in one swimming event. Uh, her pace was nine seconds off Katie Ledecky's. Uh, her pace wasn't a pool record. It wasn't a national record. It was slower than the woman who won the event the previous year, uh, and she's nowhere near good enough to ever be an Olympian. Her swimming career is effectively over because she's just not that good. She was good in one event the other events she swam in she took i think fit tied for fifth so it's not you know saying okay well she won she dominated that event well yeah she she won that event did she win everything no she was extremely beatable in a bunch of other events so we're now looking at bathroom bands uh you can see florida and utah in red and you can see the other ones in other slightly less brilliant shades of red uh so the way that some of these other states that have the yellow exclamation points, they define gender in a way that might exclude trans people from bathrooms. Uh, a couple of years ago, Tennessee uh, passed a law that said that any proprietor of a business that allows trans people to use the bathrooms on their premises had to put up a sign warning people that there might be a transgender person in their bathrooms. Oh, scary. Uh, even if it was a single whole facility with a lockable door, right? But this was just a way to shame business owners and to try and drive business away from them if they allowed trans people to use the premises. And we'll get to why that's really, really bad in a few minutes, right? So, I mean, you might be looking to go, well, you know, this, 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 yeah, this sounds bad, but this sound horrific. We're getting there. Uh, where the comparisons are. Uh, driver's licenses. Uh, these are places that are moving towards uh, eliminating your ability to get a driver's license with a correct gender mark on it. Um, And a lot of these places um, require places that require a birth, a birth certificate change. Well, if you're born a state that doesn't let you change your birth certificate, you're, you're out of luck. You're done. Right. Um, And Florida again is one of those places that doesn't allow uh, uh, changes to driver's license. So it keeps getting worse because proving if you have to whip out a driver's license, uh, that has the wrong ID on it. Uh, imagine throwing un- post-surgery been a pass on a daily basis. Imagine I get pulled over. The cop says, let me see your driver's license for Virginia. Runs a database check, says, yeah, this, this license is no good. Get, I'm arresting you uh, for driving without a license. And then tossing me in a men's prison. That's not going to end well for me. Everyone else is going to be fine except me. So again, why I'm briefing you from here in Virginia and not Florida. So birth certificates. Uh, We are seeing more and more states 
passing laws and policies that prohibit trans people from changing their birth certificates. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, anytime you need a background check, uh, anytime you have to present a birth certificate for a job uh, or to get a driver's license in a different state, uh, this is going to make life really, really difficult. Um, and it can also come into play uh, seeking a marriage license as well, um, because it means you could encounter discrimination now uh, based off of uh, states passing laws that say clerks don't have to serve uh, LGBT people. Uh oh. Well, that's that's not great either. So again, this creates lots and lots of downstream problems. Um, and the goal is to just make life so incredibly unpleasant and difficult for trans people that they don't transition or that they leave. So I just wanted to show this graph that I created right here. Um, and it shows you the absolute explosion of bills that has happened starting. You know, you saw it, you saw it jump up in 2021 and then it jumped up by an order of, you know, by, by a matter of like two to two and a half, uh, from 22 to 23. The number of bills, anti-trans bills is unprecedented. Even during the gay panic, the gay marriage panic of 20 or 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006, we didn't see this many anti-LGBT laws. This is unprecedented. This is, somewhere north of lavender scare level because the Republican party has decided this is what they're going to run on this. The American principles project spent $7 million uh, pushing anti-trans uh, ads and issues in the 2022 election. And they're still leaning into it. This is a very deliberate decision. If you look at the Republican party planning documents, project 2025, literally, in the executive summary, where they lay out their list of priorities, priority number one is getting rid of trans people. And I'm going to get to that, but you got to understand this when you start looking at the actions and policy goals of the GOP, eliminating trans people from public life is their number one policy priority going forward, period. They might not talk, they might not be talking about it on the campaign trail as much. Uh, and the media might not be talking about it as much, but when you read their actual documents and look at the bills they're filing and the number of bills they're filing and what priority they're putting on those bills, this is their top priority. This is the thing they want to do first when they have power. This is just kind of the list of what we're seeing at the national level over the past two years. We're seeing uh, bills to ban uh, trans uh, ban on trans military service, ban on health care funding for tr trans vets. Uh, and the military, so the VA won't provide any more uh, hormone replacement therapy for anybody. Uh, national, don't say gay enforced outing, a national sports ban, um, ending transition related health care as a medical deduction, uh, bans on transition related care via the FDA, uh, gender affirming care ban uh, in the form of um, basically saying that the United that banning uh, payments to doctors or institutions or hospitals or facilities that treat trans patients, right? So basically, if the way they would do it is they won't pay Medicare or Medicaid uh, to hospitals or doctors who treat trans patients and prescribe them hormones or uh, uh, give them affirming care of any sort, which basically when doctors are faced with this, the answer is, well, Sorry, I can't provide you care anymore. Uh, I'm going to lose like three quarters of my patients or half my patients. And there's only three trans patients. Sorry, I, you, you can find healthcare somewhere else. But the problem is there isn't going to be anywhere else that will take you as a patient. Finding health care as a trans person is difficult to begin with. There might only be two or three doctors in an entire town. Like I found in Dayton, Ohio, who were willing to treat you. And if suddenly they were told they can't get money from any government sources, if they continue writing my annual script for HRT, oh, they're going to tell me I'm sorry, but I got I got to feed my kids too. Revocation of federal recognition. Uh, that was something proposed by Trump in 2018. Uh, it didn't go anywhere, but it definitely raised the alarm because it would mean that you would no longer be treated by the federal government in any shape or form as your acquired gender, meaning that you would lose your passport. You would have to revert your social security gender marker. You would have to uh, revert 
any of your um, gender markers inside of federal systems um, and that you probably couldn't get any of those back until you did those or they would not be valid documentation. So that takes your passport and poof, no more passport. That's bad. And we'll get to why that's really bad in just a few minutes. Sex-based rights declaration uh, has been something that, that started out in the UK by a uh, trans-exclusionary radical feminist group has been picked up by the Alliance Defending Freedom. And it basically says that uh, it rolls all of these things into one. It basically says there can be no legal recognition of trans people as their acquired gender or as a class. They are, they, they are, they don't exist. There's only two genders and there's no such thing as transgender people. That's bad. And we'll get to that in a minute. Why? And what the historical precedent that made me go, Oh my God, this is bad. Right. So ban on doctors and taking federal funds talked about that ban on insurance. Plans from covering care. Yeah, that's that's out there, too. So not only couldn't I find a doctor, but my insurance wouldn't be able to cover me and I couldn't deduct it when I came out of pocket. So uh, and then you've got states like Ohio throwing up trap laws, right, that I'd have to go see a medical bioethicist, whatever that is, before I can refill my prescription every year or every quarterly. Right. And a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Um, Here's some quotes. And I talked about how the level of vitriol has risen. And I just want you to take a look at these quotes of how thoroughly demonized transgender people are. And keep in mind, this, these aren't fringe figures. These are people with millions of followers who get to, get to speak at center stage at CPAC every year. So I talked about this. And keep a look, calling trans people a societal poison. This is going to come back later, talking about why this is so frightening. Uh, after a transgender student was beaten in a bathroom uh, and then the next day collapsed and died, we still don't know exactly why. Um, this is what a Oklahoma state senator said. This, we don't want this sort of filth in our state. We want these people gone. These people do not belong in our society. And if it takes beating them until they die of a brain aneurysm, Okay, sure. And this is the one I really want to highlight because it's in Project 2025. This is the blueprint for the GOP, uh, whoever the next president is. This is what they're going to do. And this is a quote that I highlighted earlier, which basically says, this is in the executive summary, and this comes from the first paragraph in the executive summary, right? Or the first policy paragraph where they lay out their list of priority goals. They want, they see that the existence of trans people is inherently obscene and pornographic, and they are going to ban pornography, i.e., they are going to ban trans people, which means how am I supposed to function if I can't leave my own freaking house? If I can't, um, yeah, if there's no, if there's no more trans people online, no more trans people in books, no more people in trans people in libraries, no more trans people, uh, anywhere. The only place they can exist is inside their houses, shut off from the Internet. That's not survivable. That's not a life. But that's where we're headed. And this is, again, the number one priority. You know, and some of the overriding themes that we see in GOP uh, rhetoric about trans people is that they're satan we're satanic, we're evil. It's the greatest threat to our society. We're a threat to women and children. The U.S., and here's another one that comes from Christian nationalism, that the U.S. cannot be a great nation. It can't be a godly nation. It can't be one that God blesses, one that Christ would be happy to come back to, to bring the second coming, if their transgender people are running around happy and free. You see what I'm saying? Is that they cannot achieve paradise on earth. They cannot get to the second coming. They cannot create the conditions for the rapture without getting rid of trans people. You see where this is going. You know, transgender people steal and mutilate children. Okay, now we're starting to get into what would be a blood libel, right? The, the, if, if you're familiar with blood libel, it's the hoax, uh, conspiracy theory, that Jewish people steal children and drink their blood and or put their blood in their Seder cakes and eat them, right? This comes from the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And this is really kind of the same kind of narrative. It's being pushed about trans people, just slightly different spin on it. Although uh, one of the big conspiracy theories out there is that 
uh, trans people are actually part of a s plot by a cabal of Jewish billionaires. So you can see it all kind of coming uh, full circle. Transgender people are a poison or they're a contagion. They're poisoning our society and it can spread. And we need to stop this spread now before it kills us all. Transgender people are portrayed as an ex existential threat to the nation, to our values, to our religion, to our women, and to our children. Trans people are all the most evil, awful, horrible, threatening things you could imagine all at once. And I'm going to go to this is, but at the same time, they portray trans people as both, you know, disgusting and horrible and the biggest threat ever, but also weak and pitiable and pathetic. And this is something that Umberto Eco noted in his treatise on Ur fascism is that fascism needs enemies that are both an existential threat, but are also mockable, that are also weak and pathetic. And trans people are being set up as a boogeyman in very, very much the same terms as the Third Reich set up people. And the ultimate narrative is it's them or us both cannot survive. That if there are trans people in the United States, us good white Christian folks will not survive. Our culture will not survive. Our children will not survive. Our nation will not survive. It's them or us. And I choose us. So these are kind of where they want to go. These are the conditions they want to create, uh, which is essentially trans people cannot leave their freaking house. They cannot get medical care. They can't go out in public. They can't hold a job. They, uh, you can't. It's a criminal act to support your transgender child, even with just social transition. Right. We're starting to see more and more laws uh, in Missouri. They're passing a law that says a teacher that uses a student's preferred name or pronouns is guilty of felony child sexual abuse. They will start putting teachers, if a, if a kid says, I'd like to be called Chris, and the teacher says, okay, great, you're on the sex offender list now. And that's the same thing that they're starting to talk about doing to parents. And we're starting to see laws proposed to say any affirmation of trans youth is felony child abuse uh, and, and can land you on a sex offender list. You know, um, we're seeing in Florida, this is one of the more interesting ones, is that if a trans person calls out a politician who is singling them out, the, the politician can sue the trans person into oblivion. Um, that's a law proposed in Florida. Uh, they're trying to uh, find, get the su Supreme Court to rule that transgender people ha have no legal recognition or recognition or protections as a class. Um, they're looking to create, uh, and this is another Florida-ism, uh, laws that say that harassment uh, and discrimination is protected as long as it's a scientific or religious belief, which that's a, the intent is to go after trans people. And the way that's the way they portray it is, well, what if, what if I tell you, won't refuse to use somebody's pronouns? And that gets everybody, well, nobody can force me to use pronouns. But here's the thing. I would remind you that Ephesians 6, 5 prominently features the quote, slaves obey your masters. Uh, this would theoretically protect an employer who uses that on a black employee to, to uh, tell them why they should do something because it's a religious belief and it's protected. You can see where this goes horribly, horribly wrong. Uh, no legal ability to transition. Uh, corporations limited in their ability to protect trans employees from harassment and discrimination by creating special rights for uh, uh, employees uh, who want to mistreat their co-workers, um, mandatory co uh, coverage of detransition costs and conversion therapy. Um, they're also um, creating, Florida's doing this as well, setting up liability laws where uh, healthcare providers can be sued by patients for up to 30 years because there's this belief that there's so many detransitioners and the goal is to make it impossible for physicians to get liability insurance if they treat trans patients and they're succeeding. We're, we're seeing a number of states that have passed these laws and oh, conversion therapy is now uh, either mandatory or uh, the only uh, treatment legally available. So this is a, this I'm going to warn you up front. This is going to be really disturbing because it contains Highly anti-Semitic uh, propaganda from 1938 in a booklet produced by Julius Stryker. 
this is extremely disturbing, extremely offensive, but it's also probably the best example of all the anti-Jewish Nazi tropes together in one place. It's almost a catalog of Nazi talking points about Jews. And when I read through this, I was appalled because nearly every one of them has a direct parallel in the talking points about trans people today. And I'm also going to point something out about Julius Stryker. Stryker was hung, hanged at Nuremberg in 1946. He was Hitler's chief propagandist. He was held very much responsible for the Holocaust. This should give you an idea of how serious these kinds of talking points against trans people are because at Nuremberg, the Allies looked at what Stryker had produced and said, yes, this sort of language, these talking points led directly to a genocide and you are directly responsible. The, there is, it isn't a winding path. It is A to B to C and we can draw a straight line. And I'd also point out that there's a lot of books being produced um, their gift pills was intended for children, which is kind of creepy, but you can see a lot of anti-trans uh, children's books or books, propaganda books that have colorful pictures and stuff being produced by Matt Walsh and Chaya Rachik and Ben Shapiro. And what I want you to take away from this is that the levels and types of dehumanization of transgender people that are experiencing today is commensurate with what is seen just prior to genocide. This is from the first page of the book. Uh, and the quotes on the left, these are English translations of the book. Uh, and it compares Jews to poisonous mushrooms who are poisoning our society and poisoning our children. Uh, on the right uh, is from the a political action committee run by the man who was in the Trump uh, Trump's uh, head of OMB and is rumored to be on the short list to be his chief of staff. This comes directly from his website on renewing uh, Center for Renewing America, and it's using the same language there. Trans people are poisoning our communities. They are poisoning our children. Uh, and this is something we have to get rid of if we want a healthy society, if we don't want to get, if we don't want to get sick. On the left, you can see something here portraying... Um, Jews as, as threats to children and pedophiles and predators. Uh, in the U.S. today, we see trans people being accused of being groomers. Um, you can see literally the screenshot on the right. The, the little girls, even in the same same orange dress, uh, was from an anti-trans uh, campaign in Alaska uh, a few years back. And literally today, we saw a U.S. senator go after uh the space camp, the, the kids, you know, for, for kids and teens who are interested in the space program because they have a trans employee who works with the kids at the camp. Keep in mind that something like 20% of Gen Z uh, or Gen Alpha identifies as LGBT. These kids already know somebody who's trans. This is not as if, oh my God, it's a trans person. Ah, it was one kid who saw a trans person coming from a family of bigots who yelped to her father, who yelped to the senator, and then Chaya Rachik and libs of TikTok and uh, a senator and representatives jumped on it and said, oh my God, there's a trans person and they're around children. Think of the children. What are they going to do to those children? And the implicit narrative is these are people who will sexually assault children and take every advantage of access to children to do so. Went after Jewish doctors. Uh, and you can see on the right Babylon B going after the most prominent uh, trans doctor in the United States, who's the uh, assistant surgeon general of the United States. Uh, but you can also see that they are not going after trans doctors so much because the trans community has very few doctors. We are an impoverished community. Uh, we suffer poverty at a rate two and a half times the rate uh, of the of the general population. Our unemployment rates are through the roof. Um what you do see, though, is arguments that uh, trans people should be excluded from facilities that provide health care because they are a, da a sexual danger to women. Um, or that literally that was the argument made um, that on the, in the, the online publication The Hill, which is bending women's veterans' right to gender identity. Why? Because they were putting transgender women veterans uh, in women's groups. 
uh, or letting them use women's bathrooms. So the, the message is kind of the same. We don't want these people in the healthcare system. Get them out. Force them out. Uh, just something here. You can find plenty of examples of how to spot a transgender person. And one of the most common narratives out there about trans people is that you can always tell. You can always tell who's trans. Stupid when you say about Jewish people, and it's stupid when you say it about trans people. Um, you can't always tell who's trans. But it's a very, very common narrative. And one of the craziest things out there are uh, people online who call themselves transvestigators who run around accusing random celebrities of being transgender because they're convinced that they can tell. One of the uglier things here was I found these comparisons that basically say Jews can never become Christians. They are too fundamentally icky and evil and uh, demented and uh, deplorable to ever be one of us. They can never cleanse themselves of their essential nature. Um, and I see a lot of these same arguments about why trans people can never be Christians, that they can never be allowed into the church, that any church that doesn't uh, go after trans people wholeheartedly is not godly, is not good, is not of Christ, and that it they want churches that aren't awful to trans people to fail, and that essentially they have told other churches uh, that might be wavering is the you cannot fix these people. These people are irredeemably evil. You will not let them in if you are real Christians because you cannot fix them. You cannot redeem them. You cannot make them something other than what they are, which is satanic. There is no place for these people in our church, even if they want to be there. They accuse Jews of mutilating animals. They accuse trans people of mutilating children and children's genitals. That's really kind of... Um, and that that gets the kind of visceral re reaction you would want. And I would argue in some ways that the uh, that the accusations of mutilating children gets an even bigger reaction. It's right there with the blood libel. Here's some other parallels that I found that I didn't find as good of illustrations about. But one of the things is Jewish people are all liars and deceivers. It's inherently in their nature and in their culture. And transgender people are inherently liars and deceivers. Uh, and this is put up by some of the most vicious transphobes out there. Uh, there's accusations that transgenderism is all about the money, that it's some vast plot by billionaires and big pharma, uh, including Helen Joyce, who writes, used to write for The Economist and is now a full-time anti-trans activist, has uh, uh, you know, alleged that this is all some sort of Jewish plot in her own book. Trans people are all cheaters, whether it's in business or in sports. We are untrustworthy. We're liars. We are deceivers. Um, and one of the other narratives is that trans people deceive people into sleeping with them. There are no good ones. This was something that kind of made me go, oh, wow. Uh, and that was in their gift pills. But also watching some behind the scenes videos at CPAC by a transgender person who went incognito. Um, yeah, that was they made it very, very clear that we might let Blair White and and um, Caitlyn Jenner in the door, but there's no such good thing. There's no such thing as a good trans person. They're freaks. We don't want them in here. We humor them for now. They are useful to us at this time, but they will be discarded at our earliest convenience when they are no longer suitably useful idiots. You know, and that anecdotes are sufficient for discrimination and elimination. I heard a trans person did this. Therefore, we should, you know, ban them from all bathrooms, ban them from uh, all sports, ban them from classrooms, ban them from social media. Yeah, that's a natural reaction that people have. But I mean, the example I would give is as well, if you saw that a person who was of a particular ethnicity robbed a convenience store, does that mean you're not going to let X group of people ever use a convenience store again? Does this mean if if somebody robbed, a white person robs a bank, does it mean that white people can't have bank accounts anymore? Uh, you know, if somebody was misbehaving, uh, if you had somebody going full Karen at a doctor's office, does this mean that that class of people can't get medical care anymore? And at the bottom here, um, this is from a Trump speech. 
to the CBC something uh, Christian broadcast uh, Christian broadcasters at the national NRB convention. And Trump manages to hit two of the primary um, talking points from their gift pills. Trans people are a poison and we are going to restore truth and we are going to ban trans people from mutilating children. So there you have it. I mean, it's this is not me quoting random nut jobs. This is me quoting the guy who's going to be president again, probably at this point. Well, looking at the polling data, I think we're probably hosed. Um, and I think we should prepare for the worst. So I'm going to back up for a moment here and lead you to the next part, because I've led you by the nose to where we're at and where this goes. And this now we're going to start making the direct apples to apples policy and legislation comparisons between the Third Reich and the United States today. And this is just kind of a list of the areas where I found really, really neat, easy, one-to-one comparisons between what was happening then and what's happening now, or what Republicans have declared that they want to do, where they've declared an intent with legislation that they've filed. And I'm going to point out that when that they want trans people to leave. We talked about the Oklahoma senator. I didn't mention uh, Pasha, right? Um, I believe it was the um, spokeswoman for Governor DeSantis online on Twitter when a trans person said, what are we supposed to do? Where are we supposed to go for health care? And asked this of, of DeSantis' spokeswoman, and her response was the hand-waving by emoji. We want you to leave. You do not belong here. You should flee. You should run while you can. And what I'm going to point out and what we're going to get to is effectively what happens when Trump wins in 2024 and becomes a dictator and does all the things he says he's going to do. And this spreads to all 50 states, whether they like it or not. Let's, if you weren't scared enough before, let's keep going. So one of the first things the Nazis did is ban all Jews from sports. Well, we have bans on trans people in virtually every kind of sport. And what's really funny is when I was going through finding pictures, uh, that's a Jewish man playing chess. The World Chess Federation has banned transgender women from competing in women's tournaments in chess. I kid you not. There, and here's the thing. There's only one international grandmaster, uh, person who's trans. So they literally banned. It's not as if trans people were taking over women's tournaments. There's one trans person eligible to compete in the big tournaments. That's it. They're not even, I think they're like 400th in the world. They're not even that good, but it's, and it's not about, trans people taking over sports. There's no, there's no trans people in on the U S national women's national team. There's no trans people, um, in, in the WNBA, um, the number of trans athletes in in any given year within the NCAA is about a hundred. There's 140,000 female athletes in any given year in the NCAA. How do you take over all of women's sports with a hundred people? You can't, right? They're just, you know, you couldn't you, you couldn't even field a, a, a field, uh, you know, NC, uh, a March Madness bracket with that. It's it's ridiculous, but it's where we're at. Boycotts. Oh, yeah. Here we go. Boycotts. So the Nazis led boycotts of Jewish businesses and Jewish friendly businesses, but primarily Jewish businesses. And then today uh, you have conservatives going boycotting Target, Disney, Anheuser-Busch. Uh, because they do things like sell pride merchandise, gave a can of novelty beer to a transgender person on TikTok, um, uh, let trans people go to their amusement parks, uh, or make it clear that we're not going to kick anyone out of, of Disney World for being trans. Um, and there's literal Nazis protesting in support of Ron DeSantis outside of Disneyland over his out of his anti uh, in support of his anti-trans policies. I mean, it's not that hard to draw the draw the connection um 
and there was another one that just came up recently. Um, so banning trans people from being performers on stage or on screen or on film. Well, the goals to declare that anything transgender is inherently obscene and pornographic means that there's and banning pornography. Well, that means there's not going to be any trans people on on TV or in movies. Uh, it means that there's you're going to have a hard time having anything about trans people online on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram. They will disappear. Let me put it this way: if TikTok existed in 1934. I'm pretty sure the Nazis would have banned Jewish people from TikTok as well, right? Or do content about Jewish people from, from TikTok as well. This, it's a very clear line. And it's ridiculous too, because the, the laws that they have passed, the, the drag ban laws are so broad and overly vague that literally if you went to a performance, uh, you know, of, of the Orlando Symphony Orchestra and the third clarinetist was trans, that's technically an adult only performance because there was a trans person performing. If two people watch a trans trans person play chess in the park, that's technically a performance. If I drive through the state of state of Florida and have a sing along with my kids in the backseat as we drive to Disney world, that's technically a drag performance. Now, most of these laws are being struck down, but they won't continue to be struck down. If Trump wins, um, Trump will get the answers he wants out of the Supreme court. There are ways for a dictator. So uh, Germany uh, started expelling uh, Jewish enlisted in 34, officers in 35, and Trump banned all trans people from the military in 2017. It got tangled up in the courts until Biden reversed it, and Trump has promised to kick everybody out on day one, including myself, you know, and this one kind of makes me sad because I'm flying medevac helicopters. All I ever wanted to do was help people. I want to save lives, keep my fellow servicemen of people in California trapped by fires or floods, losing their houses, fire, like firefighting missions, hikers that get lost, families that are in danger or hurt. I wanted to help people, and I'm good at my job. But again, there is no place for transgender people in our society, and especially not one that engenders respect and admiration. We can't have that now, can we? And one, I'm going to go back. One of the one of the things that I couldn't find the quote, but and it may have been in Mouse, was one author wrote about how when Jews were dragged off, some of them were saying, claimed, I fought in the Kaiser's army. Why are you doing this? It doesn't matter if you have served, if you're an honorable person, if you're a good person. There are no good trans people, simply people who need to be eliminated from our society for the good of the country. So let's look at this. We have hit government jobs. Well, um, they banned Jews from uh, from government service. Texas and other states are forcing state employees, including teachers, to dress in accordance with sex assigned at birth or face termination. Florida, uh, Florida's don't say gay laws uh, were forcing trans teachers to either quit or misgender themselves in the classroom, regardless of when they transitioned, how long ago, how ridiculous it would be if you had a trans guy with a full beard that looks like ZZ Top having to go by Miss. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, or, and it also allows people to misgender them, um, and be mistreated in the workplace. So the goal is to get transgender people to quit, to make life so unpleasant in their federal or state jobs that there's no conceivable way that they could remain there. Okay. Universities. Well, Florida is Germany banned. Jewish professors and studies on Judaism. Florida has banned gender studies and banned transgender teachers and professors from uh, operating there unless they spend every day being misgendered, ridiculed, and not being able to talk about the subject that they're educated in. I mean, that's that's about as straight a line as I can draw. Germany created laws in 33 to, to start uh, to ostensibly reduce overcrowding in schools, to set quotas on Jewish students. In practicality, it meant that there were no more Jewish students in, in public schools. Uh, and then over time, the restrictions got more and more and more until by, I think, 36 or 37, I think 37, uh, they completely banned Jewish students. What we're seeing in the United States today is that states like Florida are passing laws that um, make life so miserable for trans students, they can't use a bathroom. There's no bathroom that they can use. They can't get access to health care. 
they can't, uh, they are not protected from ridicule and bullying, um, that schools are harassed uh, and bullied until they stop protecting trans students due to bomb threats, um, that they can't use the correct names or pronouns. Uh, essentially, yes, you're a trans student. Uh, you as a trans student can get a public education in Florida and it's gonna suck. Life is going to be hell. You're, you are probably much better off homeschooled, which is what the Jewish community did after the law against overcrowding in schools. Banned from public places. Well, that's what we're seeing now. Bans, bathroom bans, bans from shelters, uh, trans people from coming within 2,500 feet of schools, um, harassing trans people out of jobs where they might interact with kids, um, uh, drag bans that say that, you know, a trans person, you know, playing clarinet is obscene uh, or playing chess in the park with two people watching. Well, you know, uh, in Florida, uh, the, the law isn't technically a bathroom ban. It just says that if a trans person is in a bathroom, uh, they have to leave if a, if a cisgender person wants to use it, which is kind of the, you know, uh, somewhere between Aryans only. Uh, and uh, you can only ride the bus if there's no white people on it. Okay, book burning. <laughs> uh, first thing the Nazis did in 33 was it was burn Magnus Hirschfeld's library. It was the foremost institute of study on LGBT issues and particularly trans issues in the world. And it burned almost immediately before, before Hitler even got to the enabling acts. U.S. Today, well, you've talked about book bans and most of the books being banned. Lo and behold, feature LGBT people and particularly trans people. And the, the content of the books, we're talking about burning you know, um, I am jazz. This is not pornographic by any stretch. It's simply the fact that there are trans people in it. They are allowed to exist in literature. And we can't have that now, can we? All right, we already hit this one. The Reich's Ministry of Education bans Jewish teachers from public schools. Uh, we've effectively banned trans teachers from public schools and universities in Florida. So, uh I haven't gotten a chance to look at the settlement that was reached in the Don't Say Gay case, but at this point, the damage is done. Most of these teachers have already left. It's too late. They're gone. They set up a new life somewhere else. 38. They take the passports back, and you get it back if you take a big red J on it, right, so that everybody knows who and what you are. Trump administration, we're seeing states invalidating trans people's driver's licenses. We've seen the previous Trump administration came very, very close to re to passing policy that said that trans people with a passport that's had a gender marker change uh, would have to revert them or their passport is and their passport's no longer good, considered valid. Um, and that makes it really, really, really hard to escape what's coming next because you have to pray that wherever you flee to will grant you asylum. If anybody remembers the tale of the SS St. Louis, I don't think a lot of countries at this point are going to be granting trans people asylum. It's not after they've been vilified globally by the Alliance Defending Freedom and other and Russia and other malign forces. Uh, curtailed uh, Jewish activity in medical and legal professions. What we're seeing here is that it's less that anybody who specializes in healthcare for trans people, uh, which Jewish doctors typically served Jewish communities. Um, what we're seeing in the United States instead is that, and that Aryan German doctors typically refuse to treat Jewish patients. Uh, they're often frequently banned from hospitals. What we're seeing here in the U.S. is they're trying to establish it such that no doctor will willingly treat a trans patient because of laws about funding, laws about insurance, laws about liability. That's where we're going, right? That's the reason for all those trap style laws, all those laws about insurance, about government funding. They're trying to create a situation in which no doctor will ever come near a trans patient. So we come to the Nuremberg Laws, and I wanted to hit this one close to the end because this is the goal for um, 
laws that say that trans people don't exist as a cognizable class of people. Why? Because you want to get them below rational basis scrutiny. You cannot apply rational basis scrutiny to a class of people that does not exist by law. It says that they are not cognizable under any level of scrutiny effectively, which means that anything the government decides to do if if a group has no cognizable group identity is you can do anything you want. Because if it, because theoretically, under the law, anything you do doesn't affect any group of people, doesn't single any group of people out, doesn't isn't targeting a group of people. There is you don't even have to show a reason for why you're doing it. You just get to do it as the government. And that's that's what the Nuremberg laws did. That was the first part. There was the part about intermarriage, but there was also the part about um, the, the Nuremberg laws. But the first part was essentially that. Um, Jews were not citizens of Germany. They were residents only, which gave them basically said, you are not entitled to the human and civil rights that other people in Germany are, that everyone else has. And that's what's going to happen. Um, that's what they're going for with a lot of these bills to try and say that trans people are not a cognizable class, right, is to put us at a um, level of protection below everyone else in the United States that exists as a class of people. And I'm literally will say that rational basis scrutiny applies to left, left-handed left dentists with list. That as long as you can say, well, this is a group of people with, with observable characteristics, then um, then they are protected by at least rational basis scrutiny. Trans people, they're going for trying to ensure that that doesn't even happen. So I wanted to bring this up here. We What we are seeing is that trans people are fleeing and the rate that they are fleeing at, if you t- assume that they are only fleeing states that are passing anti-trans legislation is commensurate with the first two years of the, of the lead up to the Holocaust, 33 and 34, about two different surveys that I've looked at have stated that approximately 20% of trans people have already fled. And this thing is that those surveys were taken while things were only ramping up. They hadn't really gotten that bad yet. This, these sort of the data from these surveys was taken in 2022, late 2022, and early 2023 before this had really ramped into it, when it was only a threat, when these laws hadn't really started passing in earnest, and people were already fleeing. What we're seeing now is it's probably much, much worse because this data is effectively a year and a half to two years old. That flood is likely becoming a trickle, and anybody with either the money or that is young enough to not have attachments to a community is getting out. And I would hesitate to bring this up because the sample size was so small with the first study. The United States National Trans Survey came up with roughly the same numbers, and it had a sample size of 98,000 trans people in the United States. People are fleeing. And this doesn't even capture parents with trans youth who are fleeing. These, these, both of these surveys only looked at adults. Trans kids are the ones that are being affected, and I know their parents are leaving. This is, this is effectively the end of a community in a lot of these states. And it's only going to get worse if this keeps going the way it's going. What we're seeing is that we are moving towards autocracy. We know what Trump plans to do. We know that, you know, they can get a lot done, but they can't take next steps. They can't go to absolutely gross violations of civil rights you know, you, if Florida, uh, if DeSantis declared that he was going to pardon anyone who shot a trans person, the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI would step in to start enforcing civil, basic civil rights in Florida. You can see where that goes if Trump's president. Uh, but we also can see Trump declaring that he's going to be a dictator on day one. You can see him declaring that he's going to um, give the Christian nationalists whatever they want. You can see that he's talking about invoking the Insurrection Act and activating the military to d- uh, declare martial law, start putting people in camps, uh, talking about immigrants, think that they wouldn't take advantage of that opportunity on trans people. That's if, especially if they could just tell the Supreme Court to pack sand under the in- Insurrection Act. I, I think that that's, uh, I think that that's probably wishful thinking, given how much they hate and fear us and how much uh, given the um, given the level of desire and intent that they've shown in the past. You know, um, 
And the basic plan for one of the ways Trump could end up being dictator for life is come in. All officers in the military serve at the pleasure of the president. Well, you go through, you sack any generals who are suspected of not being 100 percent loyal. Yes, men. Same way that they're going to get rid of a lot of federal employees, up to 50,000 of them. Um, they've already drawn up lists of who they're going to replace and who they're going to replace them with uh, based off of Project 2025. Um, they've been recruiting. Um, the president can also name anybody he wants to be an officer. Republicans are going to uh, hold the Senate. They can, they're they going to have the votes to put anybody uh, in place to replace generals that Trump sacks. After you've got military leadership that you like, you invoke the Insurrection Act, which really isn't something that the courts are going to be able to do anything about. And at that point, you're off to the races. You can do pretty much you anything you want with generals who will never say no, the Insurrection Act, um, and a court that's been effectively neutered. At that point, you're done. Whatever Trump decides to do, he gets to do. And the thing is, is that this sounds pretty catastrophic, but it's actually pretty easy. Um, and it's something that Trump has actually talked about most of the pieces of this. The only thing he hasn't talked about specifically uh, is going after the trans community uh, using this. Uh, but he's talked about putting millions of immigrants in camps, which isn't going to work real well. It's going to be an atrocity. Um, but he and he also hasn't talked about how he's going to find a way to ignore SCOTUS. But if you invoke the Insurrection Act, you can. But there's other ways to break the system. If you weaponize the DOG and the FBI and the military against your enemies, you can simply round up the Supreme Court and black hole them until you declare the national emergency is over or declare that the Supreme Court justices were treasonous and part of the insurrection. You can um, decapitate state governments using the Insurrection Act. Um, you can. There's there's a bazillion different ways to break the system. You know, the other example I would use is if the Supreme Court says, no, you can't do that. Their enforcement mechanism is the Department of Justice, the FBI and the military, all of which are completely beholden to Trump. Stalin once observed, you know, when when someone told him that the Pope didn't like what he was doing, he observed how many divisions does the Pope have? Trump gets elected. He could do pretty much whatever he wants if he has loyalists who believe that they're on a mission from God in key positions uh, that will effectively blow off the Supreme Court if you because that's more tradition than anything else. This is and Republicans have talked very openly about our goal is to seize power for generations. Trump has installed his daughter in law at the RNC. The goal and they're merging the RNC with the Trump campaign, which is basically just an extension of the Trump board. They are setting up for a hereditary dictatorship. The all the pieces are in play. Trump has declared that he doesn't really care about the U.S. Constitution. The people supporting him, right, Jack Posobiec at CPAC, have declared that democracy holds no value, that we are going to get what we want by destroying democracy. It ends here. Why? Because these Christian nationalists don't see any value in democracy because it actively prevents them from getting what they believe God wants. And that's why they're going to effectively end the United States. And the people that are going to pay dearest price are going to be immigrants and particularly trans people, because trans people, at least immigrants, theoretically, can be sent back to their country of origin. And people without passports and without countries willing to take them in, we've got nowhere to go. So let's just talk some nightmare scenarios here. You know, Even if Trump doesn't win, we're likely to see red states continue doing what Florida is doing. We can see that we're kind of accelerating into it. Uh, and that the laws are just going to be get nastier and nastier and target uh, adults more and more. So let's just let's just say uh, Trump or a governor declares a state of emergency over trans people, declares that they're a contagion and a public health hazard, and a clear and present danger to public health. Uh, this, you know, and this has actually been we've seen it. They've declared that trans people are poisonous. They're a contagion, that they're destroying the United States. They're they're a threat to children. You know, you can also see. Uh, that they're going to claim that trans people are inherently pornographic and defining anything trans as porn as a primary vehicle to get rid of the trans community. You can use the same infrastructure used for migrant roundups, right? We're already seeing states like Tennessee, Florida, Texas starting to grab medical records from doctors and hospitals and clinics and Planned Parenthood and universities of trans students and patients. They won't say what they're using those lists for. This should be concerning, given that if you 
um, can declare that a class of people are a public health hazard or a hazard to themselves or uh, mentally incompetent as a class, uh, that lets you start scooping up people, people that you say shouldn't exist. Do you, are you starting to catch what I'm laying down about where the danger in this is? That's, and that's the thing is, is that public health emergencies and contagions grant broad powers to government officials. And that's how you can basically, and if you have a group of people that has, it's already been decided that they aren't really a group of people, well, where's their claim that their rights are being violated as a class, if they're not a class? You see how this gets easier for SCOTUS to rule the way they're supposed to, or if they can simply blow off SCOTUS, or they SCOTUS might actually agree that, well, yes, this is a legitimate power of the government, or they could be compelled to. Uh, <laughs> very much a we've sco- hey justice roberts we've scooped up your kid they'll be fine as you as long as you keep ruling the way you're supposed to this is very everything is transactional with trump and trump understands bullying very well you know about the only right people being held for mental incompetency have is you can't murder them outright that's that's basically the only right they have left and it's possible that you know uh trump could try and do this on a national basis in fact uh we would I would expect that Trump is going to, uh, once they get done with the easy things first, they're going to start moving on to how do we mop up the rest of the people who haven't fled or disappeared. And if you manage to get it put into policy and law that trans people are not an actual class of people, this gets a lot easier legally. So Trump has taken over. Let's go with second nightmare scenario. This is now, this is me catastrophizing, but I want to illustrate that. Your worst fears are actually legally possible. The things that ke- that wake me up at cold sweats at night, there's actually nothing to stop them from happening if Republicans decide this is the direction they want to go because there's nothing left to stop them. A governor says, hey, you find a trans person in public, you have a legal right to kill them under, you know, uh, that, that they are a threat to health and safety of a populace, the same way you could put down a mad dog uh, or somebody waving a gun around at a preschool. Supreme Court might want to get inter- intervene. But the only way they can intervene is even if they say, no, you can't do that, what's your enforcement mechanism? And the only enforcement mechanism would be organizations that have been co-opted by Trump and filled with people who agree. Yes, trans people are a epic level threat to the United States, our children, our women, everything we hold dear, the second coming of Christ. And this is definitely for the betterment of society that trans people are gone. Whatever, And the, these are the people that didn't take the hint and get out. Obviously, they're uh, obviously, they're the ones that are most determined to destroy our country. Trump has abused the pardon system before. He pardoned war criminals. He's pardoned Mike Flynn. He's pardoned anyone close to him, right? So if federal authorities uh, do something, and if a governor said, I've got pardons for anybody who wants them, if Trump says, I've got pardons for anybody who wants them while acting on behalf of the government, well, then you can't pursue state or federal charges. Well, if you use that to target trans people, you see where you get to a there is no justice for trans people left like this is a there's none there is no there's no where to appeal to there is no penalty to pursuing horrible things this is and this is how germany got to people beating jews to death in the streets and crystal knocked right this is this is this is how you got there and that pathway that germany used is effectively going to be fairly wide open once Trump assumes power, because a lot of what's protected us in the past is customs and traditions and respect for the institutions. And those are gone in respect for rule of law and respect for civil rights. And I'm speaking to an audience in Florida. There are towns of black people in Florida that no longer exist because white people got mad at them, swarmed in, hacked them to death, burned everything down, chased them to the swamps where they, some of them died of their injuries. Some of them drowned. Some of them were presumably eaten by alligators, and some of them, a few, escaped. It can happen here if the, if the federal government and the state government decide that a group of people are not ones that they are willing to protect from the absolute worst among us. And there's plenty of really awful people here. This can go from a Rwanda scenario to a Holocaust scenario fairly quickly. Crystal Knocked and the Wansi Conference were separated by slightly under slightly over two years. And here's the thing I'm going to point out is if you're going, oh my God, this is this is horrible, but I don't think this could happen. Yeah, yeah, well, it could. 
And I don't know that it will. And I don't know that it's particularly likely. But here's the point I'm trying to make, is that if this pathway is open, anything that's even slightly less awful is also possible. We have opened Pandora's box uh, and all the demons in hell are with us here. We're about to open Pandora's box in November 2024. You know, uh, when it comes to uh, federal service, Trump can largely bypass the Senate with interim appointees and he can bypass the Supreme Court uh, if no one's willing to enforce Supreme Court diktats. And my point that I want to make here is that no matter how good you think the system is, it won't hold up under a determined assault. Systems can easily be broken by the corrupt. And the intention is to break the system and get their way and install a permanent Trump regime and institute a government run by Christian nationalists. And one of the th quotes that I love from Masha Gessen, who wrote Surviving Autocracy, Rules for Surviving Autocracy back in 2016, was that rule number three is your institutions will not save you. Our institutions are not going to save us from what comes next. And the, the last thing I'm going to point out here is that if things do start going in the darkest possible directions, you're going to get to find out how much risk you'd be willing to take for people because there's going to be heavy, heavy pressure to not help those people. It's not going to be, there will be all sticks and no carrots. That's, you know, and I'll point out that's the reason there's only, there's only one Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but there were 8,200 camp guards at Auschwitz. My parting thought for you is, I've laid out a scenario, scenarios for you that are absolutely horrific. And maybe I'm catastrophizing. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm just looking at the worst case scenario. I think what I'm trying to show you is the path we're on. And I'm trying to show you that it's not nearly as far-fetched as it would appear that essentially that any really, really determined autocrat that wanted to get to these outcomes would be capable of doing it. If they want this, if Trump gets becomes president and they decide that this is what they want to do, there's very, very little we can do to stop them. The Weimar Republic lasted precisely 51 days between Trump being named Reich's chancellor and the enabling acts. I'm not sure the U.S. is going to make it much farther than that. And I'll leave you with these pictures here. The top left was the Waco horror. The bottom left was the American Bund in Madison Square Garden. Top right Japanese Americans being sent off to internment camps in 1942. Bottom right, FDR deported somewhere between 400,000 and 2 million Mexicans, of whom approximately 60% were U.S. citizens, and threw them across the border into Mexico, where they, many of them didn't speak the language, many of them had never lived there before, had no contacts. And Trump is threatening to do the same, but with five and a half times more people and the dreamers. And my point is that if you are looking at the saying, nah, nah, this is, this is too extreme. No, nah, it can't happen here. No. Nah. And that was a key takeaway of my, of my studies of reading Theodore Dorno and Milton Mayer and Hannah Arendt. Every society is capable of the worst atrocities seen in fascism. Every society is capable of fascism. We are amidst a fascist movement right now. And to pretend that our fascist movement is somehow less dangerous, less threatening, less scary than previous fascist movements, that's kind of wishful thinking when you look at the evidence of what this fascist movement wants, who they're targeting. And I would remind you that Jews in Germany in 1933 were about point somewhere between 0.5 and 0.7% of the population, depending on what uh, survey data you look at. Trans people in the United States are 0.6% of the population. We're right in the butter zone for a scapegoat that's eliminatable. So on that happy note, I'll conclude my presentation with only the warning that whatever you feel about Biden, if you are leaning towards not voting for Biden because you're upset with him for something, that, that's your right but it means death and misery and suffering.
for untold millions of people who don't deserve what comes next. And I'd ask you if your protest vote worth this, worth me, worth my family, is worth what comes next because there's not going to be a free and fair 2028 election if Trump gets elected. This is it. There won't be, oh, well, we'll get somebody better later. I certainly won't be around. My family won't. Most trans people won't. There's, there's 2028 is, might as well be, you know, the edge of the universe at that point. Brent, thank you so much. Bill's going to, we've got a few minutes to do some Q&A sure. and Bill's going to take care of us here. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. And thank you, uh, Bryn. Uh, I want to start with um, asking Jeff Call to uh, start the uh, questions or comments. Jeff, could you start it for us? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Bryn. Thank you so much. Hello. That was excellent. Uh, I'm USNA 74. So 97. So, uh, <laughs> you know, my wife is working on her PhD in uh, Holocaust and genocide studies. So I really understand what you're saying. Um, but my question is, the GOP, I don't think is smart enough to, to take this course. Who's, who's really pulling the strings here? So the people that have figured this out are lawyers at Heritage Foundation, Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, Claremont Institute, and the Manhattan Institute. Though that's where your brain power is, and they're absolutely smart enough to figure this out. They've already mapped it out. They know this. They've already, I've, I haven't talked about it, but I've written a number of other articles about how, yes, this is, ab they absolutely plan on seizing power forever. They know how they're going to do it. They, they, Trump has been telegraphing it by talking about replacing military leadership and invoking the Insurrection Act and um, weaponizing the DOJ and FBI and replacing all the senior civil servants in the federal government this is this is a huge telegraph that they've figured out how to bypass everything. They, they, who's, they are, who, who's funding all of this? So you have a lot of Christian organizations uh, that are, you have like the family, if you want to look them up. Um, you have multi-multi-billionaires uh, uh, like the Mercers and the Greens who are big time Christian nationalists, there is a, an unending supply of money uh, and pro bono lawyers who are w willing to bring this about. ADF brags that they've got 6,500 lawyers in their Rolodex. Um, you know, there is, you know, the, the Center for National Policy is another another one that is kind of a rather shadowy organization that has a lot of the big big players. Um, but there are there is a large supply of billionaires funding this. And I'm going to tell you something is that one of the billionaires funding this is none other than J.K. Rowling, who's pouring money into um, organizations pressing for the Women's Bill of Rights, which does a lot of the legal and uh, policy uh, heavy lifting to make it so that trans people uh, can no longer get an ID, no longer have even rational basis scrutiny, can't use a bathroom, can't go out in public. So, I mean, there's odd allies, but there is there is a lot of money being poured into this by people who have a lot of money and very much believe in a Christian nationalist dream of, of where America should go. Thank you. So I have a, a, a question that kind of runs through several several uh, comments and questions uh, while you were talking, and that is, uh, in addition to, you know, voting for progressive and pro democratic uh, candidates in November, uh, what else can we do uh, to advocate and to support the uh, trans people in our community? Well, at this point, uh, getting people out to vote. Right. Like get out the vote efforts are going to be what determines the election. If Democrat get out the vote efforts are way better than Republicans, we can probably overcome the polls. It's possible. And maybe we stave off disaster. We're going to have to take the House and we're going to have to win the Electoral College because otherwise Mike Johnson is going to pull some shenanigans and refuse to certify the election and kick the election to the House where 
even if Trump loses the popular vote and would theoretically lose the Electoral College vote, he's still going to get in based off of uh, the 12th Amendment's rules for each state getting one vote, and they would have 26, and the other states would have 22 or 24, in part because of gerrymandering. But I digress. The big thing is is, is anything that does get out the vote work, um, and listening to trans people when they tell you, we're in, <laughs> girl, you're in danger, right? Um, when we say we're in danger, we're in real danger. This is, this is something that most of the senior policy and legal wonk trans people say amongst themselves when no one can hear us is, yeah, we're done. This is, this is it. This, this, we, we regard the election of Trump as a non-survivable event. And we need people to start taking us seriously because people don't take us seriously when we tell them this. And they're, ah. But the thing is, is that all the smartest, most educated trans people I know that are most connected with this that actually study this, including uh, Heather Cox Richardson, we are all looking at this going, yeah, this is this is this is this is an extinction level event for the trans community in the United States. And I, I think the number one thing is is to, you know, take it seriously, um, take the authoritarian threat seriously, get out the word to people that Trump is an authoritarian threat that's going to do incalculable harm because only like 30% of Americans are aware of the crazy crazy authoritarian things he's been saying that, that there is this ignorance is going to get us killed and a sense of ah trump says all kinds of crazy things it's not going to happen is also um and i think the last thing you could do and this is that younger voters who are like i'm going to sit this one out because of israel palestine okay yeah you, you can do that and up to 2.4 million palestinians could die and in the U.S., U.S., and if you elect Trump, those same people are going to die just faster. Uh, but it's also going to be trans people, immigrants, the disabled, the mentally handicapped, homeless, uh, and possibly oh, atheists, Unitarians. Like, the list goes on. There's a much bigger pool of people to oppress and kill within the United States, right? Um, that the, taking the utilitarian approach to uh, ethics, um, that even if you aren't happy with Biden, that voting for Biden averts far, far worse evils. It doesn't matter if you didn't like the German Social Democratic Party in 1932, you probably shouldn't sit, sit the election out because if you, if, you know, because otherwise Hitler's going to win. Yeah, you probably should hold your nose and vote for the Social Democratic Party if you know what comes next. This will be the last question because uh, I know we have a time constraint. Um, well, I can keep going if you need to. Okay. Um, but uh, you've alluded to this in several of your answers, and I wonder if you could speak explicitly to this. Uh, is this primarily, this anti-trans movement, is this primarily a Christian nationalism um, movement? So that's an interesting question, and I would say that that's one of the primary drivers I would say a secondary driver um, is just kind of uh, what I would consider just kind of a, a secular fascist movement that you see coming out of like the, the Groypers and other uh, young Republicans who aren't particularly religious, but are just wed to a culture of nastiness and bullying and a need to see themselves as superior and needing to have a dog to kick. Um, that that be, saying horrible things about trans people and hating trans people and drinking their own Kool-Aid earns them millions of followers and the accolades and love and adoration from all over the place, right? You, your Matt Walsh's and your Chia Ray Chicks and your uh, Michael Knowles and, uh, these are the kinds of people that, and your Tucker Carlson, um, who I don't know that they're particularly religious, and they're definitely fine if people want to you know, eliminate trans people because they think God demands it. But trans people have been so deeply vilified and demonized that they just hate them on, princi on principle, right? And I'm fairly, you know, the, the Nazi party itself, uh, there were churches affiliated with the Nazis or churches not affiliated with the Nazis. And there were, you know, what uh, Milton Mayer described as fanatica, 
uh, who did it just because they believed in the party and they did it because they thought Jews were revolting and believed all the things about Jews, so they went and did it. And then there's going to be hordes of people who, you know, this who really don't care one way, way or another, but they're willing to go along because they just feel uneasy about trans people or just dislike them in general and don't know very much about it. Um, and that would be the vast majority of Germans who are like, well, I don't know any trans people, or I don't know any Jewish people, so what is it to me? Yeah, whatever, right? And if you watch, um, uh, read the book or watch the documentary Ordinary Men, you, you start to understand um, how people who really weren't ideologues, who weren't fanatical Nazis, would go along with the, the, a lot of the extermination orders perpetrated during the Holocaust. And uh, Jim, do we have a, a time for a couple more questions or what, what's yeah, your let's, schedule? Let's, let's do two more, Bill, and, oh. then, and then we'll sum up here. So this one kind of that touches uh, the mission for Freudians for Democracy. And that is that there's there's a uh, organized mo movement to create chaos uh, on the left or the the people that are against uh, this authoritarian movement. Um, so what is it that we can do other than just vote uh, that can allow us to overcome this you know this chaos of the moment? All you have to do is look at the news every 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 night uh, and see the chaos that we have. How do we, how do we get around this, 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 uh, this ability for the right to continue to drive wedges into the different segments, the different identities in the left? So that's an excellent question because one of the biggest problems we faced is we are in a post-truth environment mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it, you know, the vast majority of Republicans believe that the, the 2020 election was rigged or stolen, that they, they have alternative sets of facts or alternative alternative facts. Um, and you also have a vast middle that is is basically politically ignorant uh, or ignorant. Um, and you also have a left that isn't sufficiently scared. Um, and I think the my personal opinion, but I'm biased, is that playing this election as it's, this is this election is about the stakes, not the polls. This, is, this isn't a single issue election. This isn't a popularity contest. This, we need to make this election about the stakes. We need to get people in the middle, the, 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 the movable middle to understand that as warm and fuzzy as they feel about the stock market under Trump, you know, during the first three years of his administration, that that's not going to, they're not going to feel warm and fuzzy about that uh, after a very short period of time. Um, that, that people need to understand that democracy is going to come to a violent screeching halt over the first two years of the Trump administration. And, that the amount and the, here's the thing is, is I assumed that Trump gets away with all of this. The alternative is that um, is that the nation says no and then balkanizes and congratulations. Now you probably have a civil war. And it's, it's not great either. You know, and the I think somehow we need to let people know that what the stakes of this election are and that electing Trump is not a correctable mistake. It's not something where we can limit the damage. The damage is going to be catastrophic no matter what happens next. It's just a matter of who's going to absorb the damage. Oh, thank you for that. And the last question, and, and this uh, came from um, somebody early on, and they said that all of this makes the uh, trans youth more vulnerable to traffickers and predators. And the question is, what can we do in Florida to um, so this doesn't happen? No, <laughs> no, I have no idea. I've I've heard this. This doesn't doesn't make any sense. This honestly, this kind of goes along with the narrative that that LGBT people are groomers, uh, which gosh, you go back to the image from Dear Gift Pilts with with the girl in the orange dress in both pictures. Um, I don't think it. 
you know, what it does is it right now, where we're at now is trans youth are going to not get the medical care that they need, not to get the social support they need, not the, not get the psychological support they need, uh, are going to be exposed to bullying, are going to go through the wrong puberty, uh, all the medical it, literature that we have out there that talks about what happens when you withhold care, care from trans youth is you get worse mental health outcomes that go for the rest of their lives because if you're visibly trans, you are treated much, much worse. Um, early interventions produce trans people who are essentially indistinguishable from their acquired gender in any meaningful, in every meaningful way, or indistinguishable. Uh, and they get treated just like cisgender people and they end up having mental health that's free. You know, some, of the, some of the studies have shown that they end up with mental health that's the same as cisgender people when they've been treated well their entire lives, go figure, um, on average. You know, so these laws that ostensibly protect trans youth Every major medical organization, every parent of trans youth, everybody that's every doctor that treats them all says basically the same thing is, is that this is necessary medical care uh, and that withholding it from them hurts 99 out of 100 of them. And that a lot of the narratives about trans youth are uh, desistance is one or two percent, not 80 percent. Right. This, the amount of I, I talked about existing in a fact free um zone uh, time period, and that's something I've seen with all the anti-trans hearings, is that the same bad statistics, misquoted studies, um, falsities, same uh, traveling dog and pony show of ex-transes get dragged out in front of legislators every time. When they, when they held the hearings in Florida, they couldn't actually find any anti-trans witnesses from Florida. <laughs> they had to import everybody via the Alliance Defending Freedom. Well, uh, Bill, thanks for facilitating that, Bryn. A wonderful program. For the diehards that have hung in there with us for two hours, uh, let me just tell you where we're going from here. Um, as we've said many times, Florida is the canary in the democracy coal mine. Uh, there always has to be another enemy to control. And so we control trans. If we're successful at that, then who's the next enemy and who's the next enemy? Uh, so we have a program coming up on April the 27th with Dr. Kate Arnold. Dr. Arnold is highlighted, and you'll get information about this, in an article called Red State Brain Drain, where she and her wife, both ob from Oklahoma, ended up moving to D.C. And she'll outline exactly why they ended up moving to D.C. Uh, and leaving Oklahoma. But there's so many other key messages there. But on and on, um, we can't count on the courts to save democracy. That's already be, been very, very um, evident to us. And our slogan that um, we cannot be silent, we cannot be indifferent. So we do need to focus on getting out the vote. At the same time, we have to keep the educational levels up to find all different kinds of, of new audiences and targets to realize uh, that this is serious and that democracy and freedom are on the ballot in November, and we have to do everything we possibly can. We cannot be silent. So uh, as Maya Angelou said, um, if someone shows you who they are, believe them. And um, what Bryn has uh, shown us tonight is Trump and his cronies and the people that are financing him. It's not him. He's a puppet uh, to big money of control and power. Um, we need to listen to that message. So thanks everybody for being here. Dale's got a closing remark and uh, we appreciate it. Yeah, I was just gonna ask uh, Britt if there was any organization that is forming to help protect the trans community that we could join or contribute you with or do you, is, any recommendations? So the, the number one organization right now is in the middle of a merger. The National Center for Trans Equality and the Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund are uh, merging with one another. Uh, in the past, one focused primarily on legal fights, the other one primarily focused on um, and primarily focused on the political side. Uh, now the two orgs are merging, and that's going to be kind of uh, where I expect most of the active national level res uh, resistance is going to come from, or organized resistance. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh. Uh, can I tap my own organization? Sure. sure. 
uh, there is also Sparta uh, or Sparta Pride, uh, which is a uh, trans military organization for active duty guard and reserve uh, transgender service members. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the largest such organization out there. And we've managed to vast majority of trans people who are troops currently are members. Great. Maybe we could uh, distribute that in the chat or or distribute those organizations so that people could follow up on that. So thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Bryn, uh, if we could all applaud, there's still 35 or 40 of us, I think, between this <laughs> oh, no. group here and the others online. I'm but uh, thank you sorry. so much for your time. And uh, and thank your dogs for not causing too much trouble tonight. Uh, yeah, I just heard it once. Yeah, always good. Always. And beat army. Uh, <laughs> beat army. Okay. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.